Ladies and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to Torah Anytime or to ohelsara.com, we want to thank you so much for diligently logging on every single week. Whether you're a YouTube subscriber, if you're logging on to ohelsara.com to, or to Torah Anytime, every single week you tune in devotingly to your neshama and we're so very very proud of you. Hashem should continue to give you divine assistance. Siyata dishmaya in all your ways. Bless you. Bless your journey and you should always feel Hashem's hand in everything that you do. I want to dedicate this shiur to a very special person called Greta Johnson. We just got such a generous donation from her. Thank you so very much, Greta. This shiu, this lecture is for you. I want to bless you that, first of all, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hashem should continue to guide your footsteps. He should protect and defend you, keep you safe from harm, and constantly bring you closer to His ways. Hashem should finally give you happiness and uh, uh, guide every step that you take. Kadosh Baruch Hu should give you tremendous uh, shefa, which means abundance and sustenance and everything that you need and all the good from the heavens should come pouring down upon you. You really deserve it for all the sacrifices that you're making in order to come close to Hashem. So this shiur is dedicated to Greta and her success. Anything that we learn tonight uh, should be for your Hatzlacha. Okay, we have a lot of work to do. The Gemara of Yoma teaches us a crucial principle of life that we, meet, we need to remind ourselves of and never forget. The Gemara tells us that everything that happens in this world is a result of Hashem's will, His Ratzon. There's no such thing as a random occurrence. Nobody, no one can take away from you that which belongs to you. No one can take away your position in this world, your status, or any honor that's due you. Everything is measured by Hashem to the letter of the law. The Gemara's precise language is the following. Mikan Amar Ben Azai. From here, the son of Azai learned and said, Beshimcha yikra'ucha, by your name they will call upon you. Uvbimkomcha yoshivucha, and in your place they will seat you. Umishelcha yitnulecha, and what's yours will be given to you. En adam nogeab muchan lechavero, no man willingly touches what's been prepared for his friend. Even a hair's breadth. That means that every person receives what's destined for him specifically by Hashem. If it's meant for you to receive what's coming to you, Hashem's will will override all human effort that attempts to take away that which is coming your way. There was once a Rav who was invited to a wedding and uh, because he was so close to both sides of the wedding party, the bride's family and the groom's family, the Chatan and the Kala, he was sure that they're going to call him up to recite one of the uh, Sheva Brachot, one of the seven uh, blessings under the chuppah. And when they arrived, they kept, you know, going a one blessing, second blessing, third blessing, and nothing's doing, nobody's calling them up. And when they arrived at the seventh and final beracha, they ended up calling the name of another rabbi, not him. When they called the name of that rabbi, the rabbi wasn't there. So they looked at the list, they go, we've got to have a backup rabbi. So they proceeded to call another rabbi. 
but he was late and wasn't going to make it on time. So they now need a third default rabbi. So they called on a third rabbi who had just stepped out of the wedding hall in order to make a call. By default, because all three rabbis were not available, they ended up calling upon the Rav who thought that he'd be called in the first place. Now you could imagine what this Rav could have thought when they called his name. He could have thought, oh, I'm the default rabbi. And I, not only am I the default rabbi, I was called after three other rabbis who were called before me, which means they preferred them over me. And I'm so close with these two families. This is indeed a chutzpah. That's where his mind could have easily taken him to. So the rabbi got up. He went under the chuppah to recite the beracha. When he came back to his seat, there was an important rabbi uh, from Israel, from Eretz Yisrael, sitting next to him, who had observed the entire situation. And he whispered in his ear the following words. Beshimcha yikra'ucha, uvbimkomcha yoshivucha. En adam nogem mumchan lechavero afilu kimlo nim'a. And the message he was offering this rabbi was the following. That beracha, that blessing, had your name written on it, and nobody could take it away from you. You are going to be called by your name, and you're going to have the appropriate honor and place, because that's the way Hashem wished it to be. And if you didn't have the zechut to recite the bracha under the chuppah, one of those three rabbis would have been called up instead. Remember that everything is calculated precisely by Hashem. There will be times when you feel that you deserve something, that honor is due you, but you didn't receive it. That's the time to remember that just like your name, he tells this rabbi, just like your name was written on this blessing that you were chosen by Hashem, to recite that blessing under the chuppah, so too concerning the honor that you feel you deserve. If your name is not called by Shamaim, if your name is not announced in the heavens for a particular honor, status, or reward, you will not receive it. Remember the words of the Gemara. Beshimcha yikra'ucha uvbimkomcha yoshivucha Ladies, nobody can take away from you, not even a hair's breadth of all that's coming to you from Shamaim. If it belongs to you, it will be yours. And if it doesn't belong to you, the same principle applies. That's what the Gemara is trying to cement concerning our faith, concerning our emuna in Hashem. There's a famous Ramban, Alav Shalom, where he discusses the story of Yosef HaTzadik, Alav Shalom. If you remember, Yaakov Avinu, Alav Shalom, asked Yosef to seek out his brothers who were grazing in the fields. Yosef knew that his brothers hated him, that they were resentful of him, and that they wouldn't respond very well if they saw him. It might even be dangerous for him. But out of respect for his father, he obeyed his request and he went. When he reached the field where his brothers were supposed to be with their sheep, he realized that he was lost and that his brothers were nowhere to be found. And then the Pasuk in Sefer Bereshit states, Vayim tsa'ehu ish and a man found him. And behold, Yosef was straying in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you looking for? You seem to be lost. And Yosef said, 
I am looking for my brothers. So the man says, oh, oh, you're looking for 10 men who are grazing with sheep? Oh, I just happened to see them. They left this location to go somewhere else. This man guided Yosef straight onto the path that led him to his brothers. Now, these straightforward pesukim really don't seem to need an interpretation. It's very simple. Yosef was lost and he couldn't find his brothers. He bumped into a man who realized that he was lost. The man had seen his brothers, so he tried to help Yosef meet up with them. That's it. <laughs> it's not so uh, complicated. So why do we need to know this information? Why couldn't the Pasuk simply have told us that Yosef finally found his brothers after getting lost? Why do we need to know about the man that he meets up with and that guided him to his brothers? And even, by the way, even if this incident needs to be mentioned, does it require a deep interpretation for something that's so simple? We need the Ramban on this. But the Ramban writes, writes an entire chidush on the meeting between Yosef and this man. So let's read the Ramban's words verbatim. Shelo al chinam hayakol sipu hazeh. This entire incident did not occur for nothing. Lehodienu, this incident is informing us, it's teaching us what's written in Sefer Mishle, which Shlomo HaMelech said. Ki atzat Hashem hitakum that God's plan shall stand. Lehodienu, in order to inform us, ki hagzera emet, that God's decree is truth, veacharitzut sheker, and that diligence is falsehood. What does this mean? What is the Ramban trying to tell us? If Hashem wills something, it will come to pass no matter what. All the industriousness and efforts that we make is not going to influence HaKadosh Baruch Hu's will if He chooses to bring down the Hashgacha Pratit, the Divine Providence, towards a specific end. The Gezera is Emet. HaKadosh Baruch Hu's decrees and His justice is truth. Hashem's will was that Yosef reach his brothers. Nothing Yosef could do could stop that decree from taking place. Ki hagzera emet, because God's decree is truth. Now if you think about it, Yosef got lost. He got lost. The natural response to that would be to do what? To turn around, come home, and tell his father, Abba, I tried searching for them, but they were, they were supposed to be grazing where you told me, but they weren't there, and all of a sudden I found myself lost. So rather than get even more lost and not be able to come back, I just turned around and came home. Yaakov would have happily accepted Yosef's attempt, and that's how the story technically should have come to a close. But instead what happens? As Yosef is wandering around, lost in the field, Suddenly, out of nowhere, a man appears. The Gemara asks, who is this man who appeared out of nowhere? And the Ramban writes, Ki zimen lo hakadosh baruchu more derech. Hashem sent Yosef a heavenly guide. Shalom idato. This was not a usual occurrence because these were open fields in the desert that barely anybody visited. So where is this guy coming out from? In other words, uh, he was heaven sent. And the Ramban tells us that the Midrash states, Ki ha'ish haze haya malach. The Medrash informs us that this man was a malach. He was an angel. He was not a regular human being. He was heaven sent. You know what that teaches us? That HaKadosh Baruch Hu has a number of ways in which he propels his decree forward. Yosef got lost, but Hashem needed him to find his brothers, 
and there was no way that if he's lost in the fields, he's ever going to reach his brothers. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu dispatched a Malach from Shamaim in order to redirect Yosef on the path of Hashem's will and his decree. This entire episode with Yosef and his brothers was orchestrated in this way because Hashem wanted Bnei Israel to eventually make their way down to Egypt. And also because HaKadosh Baruch Hu needed Yosef in Egypt prior to his family's arrival. In order to direct his divine providence, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did what was necessary to push his decree forward in time. And nothing and no one could stand in the way of God's will. Not Yosef getting lost, not any external circumstance or any effort made on anybody's part. Nothing could reverse the hashgacha or stand in the way of the divine providence moving forward. You know why? Ki hagzera emet. Because God's decree is truth. And whatever is meant to happen, will happen. Because that's at Hashem Hitakum. It's God's plan, plan that will stand. And that's a great yesod. This is a, a tremendous principle. There's a story in the Navi about a man named Navot. He lived next to the king's palace. The king of Israel at that time was a rasha, an evildoer named Ahav. And he had a very evil wife named Izevel. Anyhow, every year, Navot traveled to Yerushalayim to spend the Chagim there, the holidays over there. He was a chazan, he was a cantor with a very beautiful voice, and he used his voice to inspire the masses during the Shalosh Regalim, during the three festivals that all Jews were journeying to Yerushalayim for. Chachamim tell us that there is a heavenly guarantee concerning those three Chagim on the Jewish calendar. You see, when the Jews from various parts of Israel ascended to the Bet HaMikdash, to the Temple Mount, to Yerushalayim, during the Shalosh Regalim, they would leave their homes unattended. So think about it, thousands of people leaving a giv given area would have attracted the surrounding Gentile nations who were aware of the festivals, and they could have ransacked the empty neighborhoods. They could have stolen the possessions of the Jews. I mean, what's the guarantee that their belongings and their property is going to be protected while hundreds of families leave a given neighborhood? Well, the guarantee is written in the Torah HaKdoshah itself in Sefer Shemot, where Kadosh Baruch Hu tells the people, Velo yachmod ish et artsecha. And no man will covet your land. When you go up to appear before your God. When you do that, three times each year. This is Hashem's guarantee to Am Yisrael. Our land and possessions will be protected and the enemies will not attack. In the schut. In the merit of traveling to Yerushalayim in order to serve Hashem during the Shalosh Regalim, Hashem tells us nothing's going to happen. And nothing ever happened, which is miraculous. When the Jews returned from the celebrations, their land and their possessions remained intact. Nobody trespassed into their properties to pillage, to destroy or to steal. No one broke into anybody's house. This was a miracle that took place three times a year. And by the way, the Goyim knew that we were not home, that we were all away in Yerushalayim. And instead of stealing and damaging our property, HaKadosh Baruch Hu instilled a natural fear in them that prevented them from creating a disturbance. Anyhow, uh, one day, Melech Achav looked at his window and he saw the most beautiful field. 
that field was owned by Navot, the cantor, the, the one with the beautiful voice. Ahav wanted to purchase the field from Navot so he could extend this palace to include that very unique piece of property. So he approached Navot with an interest in purchasing the land, but Navot refused to sell his land despite the fact that this was the king's request. Ahav came back to the palace feeling all depressed and the Mepharshim explained that that particular year Navot decided not to journey to Yerushalayim for the holiday and to stay home because he realized, hey, the king has his eye on my field. And he felt a need to remain put, to stay put, just in case Ahav tries to take over his uh, field while he's away. So Navot thought that staying behind was the only way to guard his uh, piece of property. What happened? Ahav's evil wife, Izevel, saw her husband all depressed and she asked him what's the matter. And of course Ahav explained that he wanted to purchase Navot's uh, beautiful field, but Navot refused him. So Izevel says to him, purchase his field? Why have to purchase his field? You are the king! You don't need to purchase anybody's property. It all belongs to you. You could take it by force against his will if you want. So Ahav and Izevel decided to bring some trumped up charges like the Democrats in America have been doing recently. Trumped up charges against Navot in front of the Jewish court. They even paid for witnesses to testify falsely against him. And sadly, the court sentenced him to death and the king ended up taking over his field. Interestingly, Chachamim state that all this happened to Navot because he did not ascend to Yerushalayim that year. If he would have traveled to Yerushalayim, he would, he would have been protected by Hashem's guarantee that nobody, not even the king himself, could enter into his property and steal it from him. But Navat thought he's smarter than Hashem, and he decided to stay home in order to protect his field. He placed a lot of effort and energy into protecting his property, and he went against the promise in the Torah. If Navot would have had bitachon, if he would have placed in his trust in Hashem and traveled to Yerushalayim in order to serve God, he and his land would have been protected. But Navot thought that his strength and, and his effort is going to secure his land. But Hashem was saying, whatever you're going to try to do to secure the land, not only will you not succeed, but it's going to be the cause of why you lose the land. Why? Because Hashem's decree is the truth. It's exact and it's measured precisely. There's a question asked by our Rabbanim. Why was Moshe Rabbeinu Alava Shalom called Moshe? We know that the Torah refers to him by his name uh, Moshe because Batia, Paro's daughter, drew him from the water. Kimin hamai mishitihu, hence the name Moshe. But in all honesty, that's not a very a thrilling or dramatic name. Kimin hamai mishitihu, because he was draw, uh, you know, drawn from the water, we'll call him Moshe. I don't know. Weren't there other exciting events in Moshe Rabbeinu's life that the Torah could have drawn from in order to give him a name that's a little bit more thrilling, a little bit more exciting, a little more dramatic? There's a wonderful answer to this question with a powerful lesson that we could learn. If you remember, Paro decreed that all Jewish male infants be cast into the Nile River in order to drown. That decree failed Paro. 
Paro's reason for throwing the poor innocent Jewish babies into the Nile was in order to destroy the Jewish Redeemer who he thought was going to die by water. Not only didn't Paro not, su not succeed in killing the Redeemer, but his own daughter saved Moshe from the very waters that Paro sanctioned the decrees upon. And he was raised in his palace, sitting on his knees and playing with his crown. That teaches us that no matter the great efforts a person implements, if a Kadosh Baruch Hu does not will it, those efforts will be proven false. Hacharitzut sheker. Our efforts prove to be false. Why? Ki hagzera emet. Only Hashem's heavenly decrees prove to be true. Atzat Hashem hitakum. And only Hashem's will will come to pass. Hashem decreed that Moshe should be saved because he was chosen by God to be the Redeemer. But how is he going to be saved if every baby is supposed to be thrown into the Nile River? So Hashem says, you'll see. Not only is Moshe going to be saved, his salvation is going to come from the king's daughter and he'll end up sitting on Pao's lap. Pao is not even going to realize that instead of killing the Jewish Redeemer, he's actually raising him. Whatever Hashem wills is going to happen no matter the human effort against His will. Why am I telling you all of this? Because this week's parasha is Korach, which must be an important story if HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to dedicate an entire parsha to it. So let's summarize the story before we analyze it. Korach waged a rebellion against the great leader and redeemer Moshe Rabbeinu. He claimed that Moshe's commands to the people were done without Hashem's instruction. He said that Moshe was a nepotist who appointed only his immediate family members to positions of stature. He claimed that Moshe Rabbeinu was a money-hungry, power-seeking individual. What caused Korach to become so riled up against Moshe? Chachamim in the Midrash of Shmot Rabbah explained that Korach and Moshe, they were first cousins. They both came from the tribe of Levi. Levi had a son, he had a few sons. One of them was a man by the name of Kehat. Kehat had four sons, Amram, Itzhar, Hebron, and Uziel. Amram was the eldest of the four brothers. He had two sons, Moshe and Aharon. Moshe became the leader of the Jewish people and Aharon became the Kohen Gadol, the high priest of the nation. After the leader and Kohen Gadol filled their appointments, instructed by God, the next question was, who is going to be the president of each tribe? This was, uh, these were very important positions to fill. Now initially, Korach thought that Moshe Rabbeinu and Aharon deserved their lofty positions because they were the sons of the eldest of the four brothers. They were Amram's sons. But Korach's father was the second of the four brothers. His father was Itzhar. So he thought it only makes sense that the next available, available position of leadership should be filled by him because he was Yitzhar's son. Before he could be appointed to any position, Korach was already uh, writing his acceptance speech. Moshe uh, is announcing uh, that it's time to choose a leader for the tribe and Korach is already, you know, he's fixing his tie and his jacket and he's ready to go up to the podium to present his speech. And then Moshe Rabbeinu says, We'd like to bestow this great honor to Elitzafan ben Uziel. What? Korach is shocked. He thinks, the, what? The, the son of my uncle Uziel? What, 
Uziel is the youngest of the four brothers. And his son, Elitzafan, is the youngest of all the cousins. He's going to receive the honor of being the president, the Nasi of the Shevet, of the tribe. Moshe and Aaron skipped over me and gave this position of leadership to my youngest cousin? How could they do that to me? Chachamim write that suddenly he was filled with this inexplicable kinah, with a deep-rooted jealousy. He could not live with the fact that his youngest cousin from the youngest uncle was chosen for a position that he thought he deserved and was worthy of. Now, we know that a person can sometimes fall into the trap of jealousy and we're urged by Hashem to take control of that jealousy. But Korach couldn't maintain his jealous rage. Before long, he waged a rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu and he enlisted 250 members of the Sanhedrin. He actually managed to rally to his side very prominent figures of the Jewish nation. And of course, uh, you know who else uh, rallied to his side? The two consueglos, uh, Datan and Aviram, the two famous troublemakers, joined the rebellion and lit the fuse, making the fire even greater. Within days, this rebellion turned into a full-blown war against Moshe Rabbeinu, and at the end of it, something happened to Korach and all his confidants, his family members, and all those, all those who joined him that never happened in the history of mankind to anyone, nor did it happen after that again. The ground miraculously opened up and swallowed Korach and his entire family, chutz from two of his children, and everybody involved in this rebellion. The ground absorbed everything they owned, their tents, their possessions, everything went tumbling into the open mouth of the Adama. They all disappeared into the ground. Korach and every person who joined his revolt against Moshe vanished off the face of this earth. And the words of Rabbi Elazar HaKapar in Pirkei Avot Alav Shalom were fulfilled through Korach. What does Rabbi Elazar say? Hakina ve'hata'ava Ve'hakavod, jealousy and lust and honor, motzi'in et ha'adam min ha'olam, drive a person from this world. Rabbi Elazar says that a person who's filled with kin'ah, with jealousy, can be removed from this world if he doesn't control himself. Those who are filled with deep-rooted jealousy uh, they can start to act in, in, in the most illogical and irrational of ways and before they know it, the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot comes to life and these people find themselves somehow, some way removed from this world. They don't benefit from their jealousy. They lose much more than they gain in the very end. The question is, how was Korach meant to control his kin'ah? I mean, if you think about it, he did have a valid and legal claim. He was the older cousin who was skipped over. How is he supposed to control his envy in those moments of being overlooked? Chachamim answer that he's supposed to have faith. He's supposed to turn to the holy books, specifically to the pages of the Gemara of Yoma, that teach us what? Beshimcha yikraucha, by your name they will call upon you. Uvbimkomcha yoshivucha, and in your designated place they will seat you. Umishelcha yitnulecha, and what is yours will be given to you. Korach's problem is that his faith, his emuna, was lacking. Instead of accepting Hashem's will, 
He started to point fingers at Moshe and at Aharon, blaming them for the fact that somebody else was chosen instead of him. He was busy feeling resentful about the younger cousin who was selected. He was controlled by irrational thoughts that everybody in Moshe and Aaron's camp was uh, simply uh, conspiring against him in order to take away what, what was his, what's coming to him, what he decided he deserved. But Korach forgot the heavenly rule that nothing and no one can take away from you what belongs to you. Especially when we're dealing with spiritually elevated positions of power. These religious positions of stature are not determined by mankind. The Gemara tells us that even the lowest community positions like cleaning the sewers or managing the sanitation department, which isn't the most prestigious uh, position, even the most seemingly insignificant positions of power, they're all sanctioned by Hashem. Hashem decides who's going to manage the transportation department. That's why Pete Buttigieg is doing such a horrible job. You know, God chose him. And he chose him in order to do a horrible job so that everybody should get frustrated and choose a Republican. But anyway, I don't know. I'm just saying it, you know. I'm sure I put a smile on your faces. Hashem is the one deciding who's going to be in charge of the sanitation department. That's what Joe Biden should have been in charge of, the sanitation department, because he really needs to learn how to clean up shop. So if Hashem is the one selecting the person that he wished to place in the lowest positions of power, al achat kama vikama, even more so if it involved those in, those in higher positions of power. But Korach couldn't control his jealousy. His emunah only went that far. He wasn't able to accept the fact that the gzera is emet that the decree from Hashem is truth. If the position of Nasi, of tribal leadership, would have belonged to Korach, HaKadosh Baruch Hu would have turned the entire world upside down in order for him to receive it. And if he didn't receive the position, it means it wasn't meant for him. Korach couldn't accept this idea. And that's what allowed his jealousy to deepen and do its work against him. And eventually, he lost himself in the process. The Ramban asks a question. He says, why now? Why did he begin this entire machloket, this entire dispute now? After all, his youngest cousin, Eli Tzafan, was appointed leader of the tribe much before Korach's rebellion. If there was ever a time to protest the position of leadership, it should have been when the positions were assigned. Uh, maybe Korach would have asked for a recount, or it, it should have taken place right after the elections. But Korach sat quietly and he did not take action. Only much later he woke up and he began to stir up an entire rebellion against Moshe and Aharon. What happened? Why did he wait until now? The Ramban explains that Korach had the mindset and the tactics of a politician. He knew that Moshe Rabbeinu's approval ratings were quite high. After all, he had recently taken Bnei Israel out of Egypt with great miracles. He went up to Shamaim to retrieve the Torah for 40 days and 40 nights. He sacrificed himself. He davened for miracles to happen, and people experienced those miracles in the desert every single day. The man fell from the heavens in order to feed the people. The well of Miriam produced sweet waters for them to drink. Moshe Rabbeinu was clearly the defender of Am Yisrael, and the people felt it, and the people knew it. And the poll numbers showed that Moshe Rabbeinu was at 100% approval rating. If someone would have dared to speak out against Moshe, the people would have lynched him. Korach knew that Moshe Rabbeinu was too popular to wage a rebellion against. If he would have waged a rebellion at that time that his cousin was appointed leader of the tribes, the tribe, the people would have buried him alive. 
So, says the Ramban, Korach stood still and he did nothing. He waited patiently for the right time. Timing is everything. He decided to wait until Moshe Rabbeinu's popularity began to dwindle. He wanted to wait until Moshe's poll numbers declined. He thought, once I see that Moshe is kind of slipping through the cracks, that's when I'll attack. That's when I'll try to get the support of the people. Now, what happened two weeks ago in the parasha? If you remember, Am Yisrael complained to Moshe about the man. They wanted to eat meat instead of the man. They were complaining about the menu in the desert. And Hashem was angry with that complaint and he sent a plague. People began to die as a result of all the meat that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was sending down from the heavens. It was that miraculous bird, the Slav, that was coming down, hundreds and thousands of birds. People thought it was a good thing and they slaughtered it and they consumed it, but it caused their death, uh, the death of all those who complained. And what happened in last week's parasha? The Meraglim, right? They came back with a terrible report of Eretz Yisrael and they incited the people to complain about their fate and Hashem once again punished them. This time, the punishment was even greater. Now, they wouldn't be allowed to enter the land, Eretz Yisrael, for another 40 years and thousands of people died every single year on the date of the story of the Meraglim for a period of 40 years until the Jewish people were finally able to enter Eretz Yisrael. But you know how it goes. Instead of understanding what truly transpired, the people began to think uh, Moshe Rabenu's leadership must be flawed. Because of him, we're now stuck in the desert for the next 40 years and he can't even pray for us this time. What kind of leader is this? And just a few months ago, many of our people died because of the birds that God sent because he prayed for those birds. What kind of leader is this? When Korah heard this, he realized, oh, Moshe, Moshe's popularity is uh, failing. And he took advantage of the confusing and conflicting moments in the desert and he began his rebellion. He waited for Moshe to be vulnerable in order to strike. That's when he began to campaign against Moshe, knowing that other people also had complaints about him. The Amban says that Korach took advantage of the weakened mindset of the people and how they sadly viewed Moshe uh, during their lapse of judgment. Reb Levi Yitzchak of Berdich of Alava Shalom teaches us something else about Korach's decision, decision to wait with the rebellion. He writes that the Zohar Kadosh states that when Am Yisrael was about to enter Eretz Yisrael, right before the story of the Meraglim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu asked that there should be re-elections. New tribal leaders were set to be appointed who'd lead the people with the transition of living in the Holy Land. So Korach thought to himself, right now my cousin and Litzafan is still the Nasi. But very soon, in about a year from now, we're going to enter Eretz Yisrael, and he's probably going to lose his position, which I'm sure is going to be given to me. So you know what? It's not going to be worth it for me to create a whole trouble, a whole balagan over here, over this situation, because uh, my cousin's position is only temporary, so I don't mind waiting another year. But after the sin of the Meraglim, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu decreed that Am Yisrael would have to wander around in the desert for another 40 years, Korach had to rethink. He's thinking, I, I have to wait another 40 years? Well, I thought I'd be appointed already next year. But not only am I going to have to wait another 40 years, but who knows now if I'm going to get the job. I'm not waiting 40 years. I mean, I don't mind controlling my jealousy for another year or two. But to control myself for the next 40 years? For this reason, says Reb Levi Yitzchak, Korach reacted after the episode of the Meraglim and not before. But there's another interpretation said by the Imre Baruch, Alav Shalom. He writes 
that there's something very unique about Eretz Yisrael, about this holy land. We all know that this land is holy and that there's a concentrated Kedusha that's here specifically and nowhere else in the world. But there's something else about this land that you should know that the Imai Bauch writes. And a lot of Mephoshim write it. The hand of God can be seen everywhere in the world. But specifically in Eretz Yisrael, the divine providence of Hashem, His Hashgacha, is very pronounced. In this holy land, we see very clearly how everything is orchestrated by the hand of God. Although God guides and oversees every country in the world, but Eretz Yisrael is the one place on the globe where His eye, direct eye, where His hashgacha, where His divine providence is very evident and it's on display and it can be seen with open eyes. We feel it here in a very intense way. As a matter of fact, the Pasuk in Sefer Devarim states, Eretz asher Hashem elokecha doresh a land that Hashem your God looks after, tamid einei Hashem elokecha ba. The eyes of Hashem your God are always upon it. Mereshit Hashanah, from the beginning of the year, ve'adachrit Hashanah, to the end of the year. The eyes of Hashem intently watch the Holy Land of Israel. Everything that happens here is with the direct hashgacha of Hashem and not through any kind of sar, not through any angel. You see all the other, other nations, they're governed by and they're overseen by a specific malach, by a designated angel that God dispatches into the world in order to control their fate. Of course, that angel reports back to Hashem and he doesn't make a move without his permission and his instruction. But the difference is that whatever occurs over here in this holy land is not being guided by an angel. It's being guided directly by God without any intermediaries. Now, when the Jews uh, entered Eretz Yisrael during the times of Yehoshua ben Nun, alav shalom, there was an entire land before them and it was the land of their forefathers, given to Avraham Avinu alav shalom, and his descendants by Hashem for the, forever. It took Yehoshua seven years to conquer the land and to make it fit for the resettlement of the Jewish people. With Hashem's guidance and his direction and command, Slowly but surely, all the other nations of the world who were occupying the land were removed. It took seven years of battling to fully settle in Eretz Yisrael. And finally, Israel was under the jurisdiction of the Jewish people. But believe it or not, there was a bigger issue than the idol worshippers who were occupying the land. What was the problem? Yehoshua had to divide the land. Who's going to live in the north? Which tribes are going to live in the south of Israel? Which tribes are going to live in the east, in the west? You can't p tell people to run into the land. Just run and pitch your tent wherever you want. First come, first serve. This is not the wild, wild west. If they would do that, it would be bedlam and many people would die. There has to be a system put into place, and it, and it can't even be done by Yehoshua. It can't be done by a, a, a human being. So since the owner of the land is really Hashem, He's the one who should decide where people should live. How did Hashem decide which tribes should live where? He told Yehoshua to make a lottery according to the word of God, al pi Hashem. That lottery wasn't a typical lottery. People, the tribes, actually heard the Shekhinah HaKdosha, the Divine Presence, speaking from within the lottery. They heard a voice emanating from the lottery that said, Shevet Levi will settle in this specific part of the land. And by the way, the voice provided the exact coordinates of that piece of property, the beginning and end of the borders of that particular piece of land. And not only was each tribe taken care of, 
but every family in a, in a tribe was also given specific uh, pieces of land that would belong to them. They too were instructed the size of the plot of the land, the beginning of the, their land, the end of the land, the borders of their land, that too was determined by Hashem. So any Jew who inherited Eretz Yisrael during that time clearly knew that he received his portion directly from Hashem. The people did not, uh, 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 the people were not the ones who acquired the land due to their own industrious efforts of any kind. Eretz Yisrael is the only land that was parceled out directly from Hashem. And these were the words of the Gemara coming to life, what was happening here. Uv bimkomcha yoshivucha. And in your designated place you will be seated. No one was able to complain about the living arrangements because they heard it straight from the mouth of God. They knew very clearly that everything was ordained and guided by Hashem Himself, so there was very little to argue about. And I'll share this secret with you. Chachamim tell us that it's like this anywhere we live. The house you're living in was apportioned to you by Hashem who decided that you should live in that specific home, in a designated area, on a specific block. But because, you know, there was no uh, heavenly lottery and we didn't hear God's voice instructing us, we assume, oh, we're living where we're living because of our own efforts, our own skills. But that's not the reality. The re reality is that, uv bim komcha yoshivucha. The Gemara says that not only is your place of residence orchestrated by Hashem. But guess what? It was preordained and it was announced 40 days prior to your birth. That's how divine it is. Bore Olam is the one guiding our every step and he maneuvers the results according to his will. Ladies, Eretz Yisrael is guarded, guided and protected by Hashem directly. Chachamim say that as long as the Jews were heading towards and willing to live in Eretz Yisrael, they were connecting themselves to Hashem's hashgacha, to His divine providence. They were plugging into a place where the hashgacha pratit is very clear and very exclusive. As long as the Jews in the desert were advancing towards their life in Eretz Yisrael, they were plugged into that heavenly providence. Even Korach had the emunah, had the faith of living in the Holy Land. But once the Meraglim returned, the spies returned with their negative reports and they incited the people and caused them to be afraid, cautious and weary of entering the land. Once the people's inspiration of living here had faded drastically, that caused them to be severed from the Kedusha of Eretz Yisrael. The guarantee of Uv Bim Komcha Yoshivucha, of being seated and placed where they belong, that bond that held that promise strong, was now severed. There was no longer a connection to the land. Suddenly there was a distance of 40 years placed between them and the Holy Land. And that's when Korach understood that there was a severe and negative consequence as a result of Bnei Yisrael's reaction to this holy land. And once the people were punished with such a harsh decree of not entering the land for an additional 40 years, and when Korach realized that part of the Hashgacha of Eretz Yisrael was no longer protecting the people, it's at that moment that Korach as well began to lose his connection to the divine providence. In other words, as long as we're somehow connected to Eretz Yisrael, we're reminded, it's a constant reminder, that everything is from Hashem. But now that there was a delay in the process of Aliyah, of ascending to the Holy Land, that delay was felt by Korach and it caused his emunah 
to decline. Chachamim say that at that moment when he realized, hey, if I'm feeling good about not entering the land, if my emunah is dwindling here about the land, I have to do a chashbon nefesh. I have to introspect. He should have introspected, Chachamim say, and should have, he should have asked himself why he's experiencing a lapse of faith. Instead of using his energies that he possessed to see and feel the messages of Hashem and to correct his own path, he misused those energies. So the Midrash asks a question. Why was Eretz Yisrael originally referred to as Eretz Kna'an? Kna'an was a person, someone who inhabited the Holy Land, and eventually Kna'an became an entire group of people. They became a small little nation. But why was this Holy Land given a name after Gentile, a Gentile citizen? Not only that, but there were seven nations who were living in Eretz Yisrael, not only the Kna'anim, so why wasn't this holy land named after any one of those seven nations that were living here? And the Midrash answers that from all the nations who were living in Eretz Yisrael at that time, when the Kna'anim heard that the Jews were going to be resettling in their homeland after traveling in the desert, after being freed from Egypt, when they heard that the Jews were being directed and guided by God to occupy the land, when they realized that Hashem's promise to Avraham Avinu that his children would inhabit the land after being freed from bondage was about to be fulfilled, the Midrash says the following, listen to these words. Kevan sheshama she'Yisrael ba'im When the Kna'anim heard that the Jewish people are about to occupy the land, they cleared the place they left on their own. Amar, God told Kanaan, Atem pinitem et hamakom, you cleared the land and you went somewhere else to live in order to make room for B'nai Israel because you accepted my decree that this is indeed the land promised to their forefather Avraham. You didn't wage war against Am Yisrael in order to retain your territories. You did not challenge my decree and instead you accepted my will and you left the land. Not only will I compensate you by offering you another good land that you can live in, and the Medrash states, by the way, that God offered them the, the country of Africa, but Hashem says, this holy land is going to be called after you. It's going to be referred to as Eretz Kena'an. Even the original name of Eretz Yisrael personifies the idea of those who recognize the divine will and don't do anything to challenge it because they know ki hagzera emet that God's decree is truth. That's what Eretz Yisrael truly represents. The holy Reb Elimelech of Lezinsk, known as the Noam Elimelech, alava shalom, he had a holy brother named Reb Zosha. They were both great tzaddikim. They were once traveling and were sleeping in various inns, hostels, and in homes where people would be willing to put them up for the night. One night they arrived in a particular city and they couldn't find lodgings other than a pub. And the owner offered to let them sleep in the back of the pub where there were two uh, beds over there. So Reb Zusha and the Noam Elimelech, they set themselves up and they got ready. Uh, to retire for the night. That night, however, unbeknownst to Reb Zusha and to, Reb, to the Noam Elimelech, was the holiday of the Goyim, and many of them went to the pub in order to get drunk and to celebrate. So the pub was full of revelry, drunk people, a lot of noise, and in the back these two tzaddikim were trying to sleep. Suddenly, Two drunk men that kind of stumbled into the back and they saw Reb Zusha sitting on his bed. They immediately realized that Reb Zusha was a Jew. 
and they decided let's poke fun at this guy. They pulled him out of his bed and they started dancing with him and poking fun at his expense and slapped him around a little bit. And after they had their fun with him, but they threw him back on the bed and they left. But 15 minutes later they came back and they started to bother him again, dance with him, make fun of him, slap him around a little bit, and they did that a few times. So Rebelli Melech, his brother, turned to him and he said, you know, it's not fair that they keep picking on you. They don't realize my bed was all the way in the back. They don't see me, but they're doing this to you. Please switch beds with me. This way when they come back, instead of bothering you, they'll bother me for once. And Reb Zusha said, my dear brother, it's not necessary. Whatever's meant to happen to me will happen. But Reb Ali Melech persisted, so Reb Zusha agreed and then they switched. They switched beds. The two men came back and they were about to bother the rabbi sleeping in that first bed, but one of them all of a sudden said to his friend, you know what? We bothered this poor guy so much, eh, let's leave him alone. Let's get the other one. <laughs> let's bother the other one. Ah, Reb Zusha said, what's coming to a person will happen no matter what he does. We could try to outsmart Hashem's Gezerah with all of our human efforts and manipulations in an attempt to save ourselves. But if God decrees something, it will come to pass despite our attempts. Ki hagzerah emet, because God's decree is truth. That's where Korach failed. He failed to recognize that the tribal position given to his youngest cousin was divinely commended by Hashem. Instead, Korach allowed his jealousy to cloud Hashem's will. He tried to point fingers and to blame anyone that he could because he didn't want to accept the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was orchestrating everything. And Chachamim want us to know that this entire tragic episode of Korach occurred because the people disconnected themselves from Eretz Yisrael. Had the people not allowed the negativity of the Meraglim, of the spies, to affect their faith in God's promise of the land, they would have entered the land and they would have felt and seen the unique and divine providence very clearly. And by the way, for those of us who always uh, try to talk about, oh yeah, it's not so safe in Israel, and surrounding, you know, uh, 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 concerning the antagonism of the Middle Eastern countries that cause us so much pain and suffering here in Eretz Yisrael, the answer to that, that the Chachamim give us, is that even though the Rashaim who attack us in an attempt to destroy us do have to be dealt with strategically and with our defense, but we must never forget, Chachamim say that, any time there's tragedy and calamity anywhere in the world, it's a message from Hashem that we need to repent, that tikkunim have to be wrought, certain prayers have to be recited, we have to take certain things upon ourselves, and that we need to come together as a nation in a united effort to foster the geula. There are many reasons why Hashem sends a tragic event to the world. But it's during those times that we have to introspect and ask ourselves why this is happening and what, and what we could do in order to change something in our life, in order to prevent it. The Holy Marbit, Shalom, who lived in the city of Tzfat during the era of the Ari HaKadosh, Shalom, he interpreted the words of the Gemara concerning the way we daven, the way we approach Hashem in our prayers. The Gemara says that when we dive into Hashem, we have to praise Him. Only after we praise Him should we ask for our personal requests. And the Marbit comments on these words of the Gemara and he says, that sounds a little fake. We, we tend to do this, by the way, between ourselves and our fellow men. There are many times that we praise people falsely because we actually need something from them. Asks the Maubit, what, are we playing games with God? Uh, we're praising Him with some ulterior motive? Praising Him with the hope that He'll grant our requests when we ask? 
Isn't that a little fake? And the Marbit answers this question by explaining, first and foremost, the praise that we offer Hashem is not false because everything we're saying is actually true. He is a gibor, he is an ora, he's awesome and he's great and he's gadol. Uh, we're not, that's, that's Hashem, that's his qualities, this is his characteristic, it's not a lie. And he says, and in addition, Hashem knows who he is and how great he is. He doesn't need our praise. No matter how much praise you're going to offer, it's never going to be enough for the infinite, the infinite one. He says that when we praise Hashem, it's not about Hashem. It's about what we're learning in the process of praising Him. When we dive into Hashem, we have to ask ourselves why it is that we're even approaching Him. Why are we requesting anything from Him to begin with? And that question prompts us to understand that He's the only one without limitations. He's the only one that if He wishes to solve our dilemmas of life, He could do so in a moment. As human beings, we're limited. We can try to throw, you know, all our nisyonot, all of our challenges of life in the direction of the biggest rabbis out there. But they're also just human beings. Says the Marbit, we need to understand that there's no human, human being out there in the world, no matter how big and great he is, who could solve the challenges of our life other than the Ribbono Shel Olam, other than Hashem. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is HaMelech, HaGadol, HaGibor, VeHanora. God is the king, he is great, he is strong and powerful, he's exalted. And when we utter these words of praise, it's not false flattery. These are praises that are making us realize that because Hashem is so great, so exalted, so infinite, so powerful, so merciful, because he's all those things and more, He's the only place, He's the only one that we can turn to for all of our requests. And because He's so mighty and exalted, if He wishes to, He can decree that our challenges be diminished. God is the only one who could execute a decree on our behalf to, uh, to make it either big, uh, sorry, big <laughs> or small. There's nothing that binds Hashem from bringing His will to fruition. And when we praise Him, we're reinforcing our emunah in Him that only He could help us, only He could save us, and only He could redeem us from our nisayon. That's why we praise Him before we turn to Him with our requests. But, says the Ma'abit, at the end of our tefillot, at the end of our prayers, what do we do? We thank Hashem. We thank you, Hashem, asks the Malbit. Why are we thanking Him? We didn't, even, we didn't even yet get answered for our requests. Our requests were not yet fulfilled. So why are we thanking Him? Shouldn't the Modim Tefillah be pending with the fulfillment of our request? Shouldn't we thank Hashem only after we've been answered? Why do we thank Him immediately after we make a request? Says the Maubit. The purpose of Tefillah, the purpose of our prayer, is not to receive what we want. Although at times it is the outcome of our prayers, but that's not why we pray according to the Malbit. We daven because we come to the recognition that Hashem is all-knowing and almighty and has the ability to do everything and anything at any time, anywhere. Therefore, we thank Hashem even before He grants our request because we know He most certainly does have the ability to provide what we ask for and if it is His will, He will grant it. So we thank Him not for what He will give but what He has the ability to provide at any time that He sees fit. 
Whether Hashem grants our request or not is not the point of our prayer. The purpose of tefillah is to elevate our emunah, is to elevate our faith in Hashem and to solidify the fact in our minds that nothing, nothing will stop Hashem from bringing His decree to light. Davening to Hashem makes us realize that the words of the Gemara of Yoma are indeed true. Beshimcha yikra'ucha By your name they will call you. And in your place, they will seat you. And what's yours will be granted. No man willingly touches what's been prepared for his friend. Even a hair's breadth. In the schut of this recognition, in the merit of this awareness that everything is apportioned to every person as Hashem wills it, it will create, hopefully, a merciful reciprocation by Hashem to grant uh, our requests. Yehiratzon, that our emunah should be strengthened by the recognition that everything we have, all that we possess, where we live, and the positions of our status and stature, are all Hashem's doing. May that emuna create an inner serenity in our life, knowing that whatever comes our way is meant to be, and whatever doesn't was also meant to be. May our hearts and minds follow the path of faith and trust in Hashem, and in that zechut, may we feel and see very clearly Hashem's guiding hand as he leads us into the world of redemption. Bekarov mamash, amen ken, yehi ratzon.